Stepping further ahead, I would now like to present before you all the profile of Dr. Bruno Geta. Bruno Geta is the Senior Lecturer and Director of Studies of Bioinformatics Engineering Program in the School of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of South Wales in Sydney, Australia. He trained as a molecular biologist before making the switch to bioinformatics before it became fashionable and worked in both academia and industry as a founding member of Australia's first bioinformatics startup. His research interests span the study of sequences, structures, and protein expressions with focus on the applications of computational biology to understanding the immune system. He is also a passionate advocate of the place of bioinformatics in scientific discovery and education. He is highly active in professional societies as treasurer, executive committee member, and director of the International Society for Computational Biology, and has been an executive committee member of the Asia-Pacific Bioinformatics Network since 2008. So, it indeed is a matter of immense pleasure to have you amongst us today. I would now like to request Dr. Bruno Geta to speak, please speak a few words. Sir, please. Thank you very much. I will uh, share my screen and um, start the, um, let me make sure which one it is. So, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to, to speak at this, uh, at this symposium. Um, my talk is going to focus on immunoglobulins, um, better known as antibodies. Now, antibodies have been the focus of an enormous amount of work. It really is um, something that, that impacts medicine through and through. And of late, we've heard a lot about antibodies um, through um, due to the, to the pandemic. So, just to remind you that the antibodies are those Y-shaped uh, molecules that interact with viruses. This is from, this slide is from the PDB database and it shows actually the, the rhinovirus, common cold virus to scale with the antibody here. Uh, this is one example of an antibody. This is an IgG. And the antibody is this Y-shaped molecule, which has got these variable regions and those variable regions um, bind uh, antigens. They bind foreign bodies and essentially prime them uh, for being recognized by the immune system, for being destroyed by macrophages and so on. And really the antibodies are what constitute the, the memory of the immune system. Um, the antibodies, the variable regions, emerged through this accelerated evolutionary process, uh, this combination of mutation and selection in the variable regions, which means that there's a huge variation in the variation in the variable region of the antibody. And it provides highly specific binding and recognition of a specific antigen. So what I'm going to talk about is a, a range of work that we did over the years uh, focusing on antibodies starting from talking about antibody genes, immunoglobulin genes, these are the genes that encode the antibodies and are really um, responsible for the variability um, in the antibodies. And uh, if time permits, I'll speak a little bit about the work that we're doing now on the antibody protein, um, always using bioinformatics as a way to try to understand uh, these molecules and how they work. So starting with antibody genes, obviously there are millions and billions of possible antibodies, but these are not all encoded in the genome. What is encoded in the genome are those germline genes um, that represent parts of the antibody sequence. And when the um, antibody producing cells differentiate, those genes get re uh, rearranged and you get essentially one V, one D, one J gene that gets spliced together uh, to form a specific anti novel antibody uh, variable region. 
And this process um, is different in every antibody producing cells, which means that as those antibody producing cells differentiate, they all result in different uh, immunoglobulins. But that represents only part of the diversity story. This is only one mechanism through the diversity of antibodies is introduced because this joining that happens between the V, the D, and the J um, is actually an imprecise joining. And there's a range of um, processes that happen that I'm not going to go into, which are P addition, N addition, there's action of azonuclease that removes nucleotides. Uh, and then there is the process of hypermutation. And uh, the process of hypermutation is what leads to the refinement of the antibody uh, so that it matches an, anti an antigen really precisely. Uh, the somatic hypermutation means that when the immune system encounters a new antigen, those antibodies that match this antigen get encouraged to divide, but also to mutate. And as they mutate, uh, some of those antibodies are going to match the antigen better. And those that match the antigen better mutate further. So that what you have is this accelerated evolution process that ends up with the production of an antibody that matches uh, the antigen very closely. And this is how the uh, immune system develops some form of memory. Now that process takes a bit of time to happen. Um, and it's dependent, it, it does happen that the, the antibodies are always going to converge towards um, an antibody that matches the antigen, but it can take more or less time depending on what you start with. And what you start with really is the antibody genes that you have. So there's also a lot of interest in those germline genes. So the germline genes is what's inherited from the, your parents. These are those component genes, this B, this D, this J gene. So there is a lot of variability in those genes as well. So there is a lot of individual variation between, the, uh, between people as their antibody genes. But that is very difficult to characterize. Um, pretty much all the projects that have focused on variation in this look have ignored this locus because it's too variable. It's too confusing. And often the human DNA is sequenced from rearranged antibody cells. So you actually miss out on those, this part of the genome. Uh, and because it's a region which is very repetitive, it's very difficult to sequence through as well. All the changing now that we've got uh, technologies such as nanopore. Um, so just showing you a quick picture of that locus, which is very complex. But this is what you look like at, if you look at it in the thousand genome projects, essentially this entire region is masked with a big deletion. So the way in which um, myself and my collaborators have approached that in the past is to look at mass sequencing of rearranged immunoglobulin gene sequences. So instead of trying to sequence the germline genome, we sequence the antibody producing cells. But of course, every one of those is going to be different. So what we get here by sequencing these um, variable regions is a very large number of, um, of sequences. You know, and we started doing that with 454 sequencing when it started. Uh, and now a lot of other technologies can take the place of that. But the process here is once you have these data sets, which can have millions of different um, rearranged immunoglobulin genes, how do you work your way back to the germline? Um, and based on these data sets, we really developed a series of methods uh, that allowed us to identify clonally related sequences, to define the genotype and to define the haplotype of an individual based on those rearranged uh, sequences, as well as refining the germline repertoire. And what's core to all of these methods is 
an algorithm, a model that we developed early on, where what we called Immunoline. Um, it's spelled that way because the HMM there um, indicates the fact that this model is based on a hidden Markov model. Now, if uh, you have done bioinformatics, you have heard of hidden Markov models. They are essentially a, a, a probabilistic model of a, of a process. And in this case, we have built this hidden Markov model to represent this process of antibody generation of gene um, joining, rearrangement, mutation, uh, and so on. And that, uh, that model is a probabilistic model. It's, um, it's informed from um, known data about the rearrangement of immunoglobulin sequences as well as um, the information which is present in the sequences themselves. Uh, and the goal of this model originally was to say, okay, here we have a rearranged sequence. Can we predict its component germline genes? And what probability can we get from that? So without going into the details, um, this model reverse engineers a series of steps in the uh, immunoglobulin generation. Um, the first step that it uh, models is the, um, the immunoglobulin rearrangement process itself. So the, the splicing of those genes. And then the model incorporates um, stages that model all these different uh, um, processes. So the P addition, the addition of uh, palindromic nucleotides at the junctions, an addition, which is a non-template encoded addition of nucleotides, exonuclease action that actually removes nucleotides, deletes nucleotides at the junction, as well as the process of somatic hypermutation. And it does that by uh, modeling the, um, the position dependence of the, um, the somatic hypermutation, so the probability of mutation depends on the position along the sequence, for example. And it also depends on the sequence of the, um, that's being mutated. So the traditional model there is that uh, the sequences, those consensus sequences, RG, Y, W, W, R, C, Y, W, A, N are hotspots for mutation. And they're more likely to be mutated by this process of um, somatic upper mutation. Um, so my colleague, uh, my colleague Andrew Collins spent quite a lot of time refining those models um, and developed, in fact, a trinucleotide score model, which is incorporated in Immunoline. Um, so Immunoline pretty much originally works as a way to identify the germline genes, uh, starting with a blast search of the, uh, of the V gene, which is long enough to be identified with a blast search. And then it builds the HMM based on prior knowledge and based on this alignment. Um, and once you've got the HMM, then you can take an individual rearranged sequence and feed it through the HMM and reconstruct its, uh, its origin, reconstruct its germline genes. Uh, this is just showing what the HMM looks like in terms of topology. Um, I won't go into the, the details there. But suffice to say that this HMM works pretty well at reconstructing the germline gene history of, um, of a rearranged sequence. Um, we developed as well as uh, Immunoline, we developed a number of benchmarks to evaluate uh, the performance um, of the system. We use clonally related sequences. We use randomly selected sequences. Um, what we found um, is that Immunoline did better than the competitive, the other programs that, um, that try to do the same thing. Um, all of those are, are details in, the, um, in our papers. Um, we also developed a data set that is used to test those um, different methods. And again, Immunoline overall um, does best, has the best performance across the, um, 
all three gene types, V, D, and J. Some methods have a better performance um, with, um, by the way, shorter bars is better. Yeah. Some of them have better performances with one of them, but overall immunolign is better. Now, immunolign was a long time ago, and um, it's no longer being developed. There's been other methods that have come, newer methods that have now uh, replaced it, but all these methods actually have adopted the same uh, algorithm as immunoline. So it, the, the thinking behind immunoline underlies most of the, the modern methods now. But this model, which is more than an alignment method, it's a, it's a probabilistic model, helped us to also look at um, identifying clonally related sequences. So when we sequence these millions of rearranged immunoglobulins from a, a, a donor, from an individual, what we want to do is be able to reconstruct their, their history, uh, to reconstruct it in the form of trees that way. So one of the um, approaches that we used was to try to identify those groups of coronally related um, in your immunoglobulins, pretty much by using a clustering approach. So using immunoline, we were able to, to develop this um, uh, a, a way to build a distance matrix from pairs of sequences and from there you can um, cluster them, build a genogram, and then select a threshold and that threshold allows you to identify clusters pretty much. Um, and that provided a method to identify those, um, the, those clonally related sets. Um, I'll skip the slides. One very interesting problem that we then faced is to try to reconstruct the germline genes of the individual. So as I mentioned before, it's very difficult to sequence the genome, the germline genome in the um, immunoglobulin locus, but it's very easy to sequence lots and lots and lots of rearranged genes. So the question that we asked is, if we know the sequences of all these rearranged genes, can we work out the germline genotype, uh, which V, D, and J genes that individual has? And that's pretty much trying to identify the combination of, of alleles that maximizes the, uh, the probability of the observed data. Uh, the method that we have um, uses a series of steps. Um, and uh, when we tested it with um, different, um, different clones and different individuals, it did allow recreating the, uh, identifying the, uh, the genotype. So this particular experiment makes use of um, data from twins. And you can see that it groups the twins together um, as you would expect. So once the genotype is identified, the next step is to determine the, um, you can then re-identify the, um, the germline genes and you can then refine the process. So it becomes iterative. Um, but then once you've got the genotype, you can also try to determine the haplotype. So which genes sit on the same chromosome next to which other genes. And you can do that again by looking at the rearranged sequences. Uh, it's mostly due to the fact that there's a limited number of J genes available. So if you see different V genes that share the same J gene, then they're likely to be on the same um, chromosome. And again, we address that using um, a machine learning approach, um, pretty much a classification approach, trying to classify um, between a, a range of um, of methods, of, uh, of, of classes. And um, my student, Gillian Shen, um, was able to develop this method based on logistic regression that allows um, classifying the, the haplotypes. So now I'm just trying to check how I'm doing for time here. Um, So, uh, you can also build this utility 
uh, that allows drawing those uh, haplotypes of the um, of the uh, heavy chain variable region locus for different um, for different patients. So that's the part of the talk that deals with immunoglobulin genes. Um, when we started this work, we were one of the very few in the world doing it, and since then it's really exploded and a lot of groups are now working on this. And it's a very exciting new field. Um, now all those groups were better funded than us. So we decided that we'd better leave the work to them and move on to really one question that has fascinated me for a long time, uh, which is at the level of not the immunoglobulin gene, but the immunoglobulin protein. Uh, the question is really, can we use machine learning to try to predict um, what antigen and antibody binds to. Because we know, as you've seen, we've got those data of millions of rearranged antibody sequences. So we can sample that from the blood of a patient, but we don't know and we can't determine what these antibodies actually do. We can't tell what it is that they bind to. Unless you go and do the experiment, antibody by antibody, it's very hard to determine. So I'm going to take an, a, pro, a project to try to, um, to try to predict, develop methods that can predict the binding antigen based on the antibody. That is, as you can expect, an extremely difficult problem. And we haven't got there yet. Uh, what I want to share with you is a couple of approaches that, that we're walking towards. One of them is to try to, um, to use unsupervised learning to cluster antigen into clusters, because if we can predict a class, uh, that's easier than to try to predict the individual uh, antigen. And for that, we try to determine, uh, to build a distance metric that represents the difference between binding sites uh, for, a, for a protein. Now, that's not a new problem. Uh, that's been really done a lot uh, in, um, in drug design, there are many different solutions, um, but they work mostly for very similar molecules. We decided to branch on a method based on pharmacophores. That's something that's really used in drug design. And it's about representing molecules in terms of um, a combination of um, spatial and chemical properties, uh, pretty much. But what we wanted was a way to compare pharmacophores and to compare molecules based on their pharmacophores. Um, and what my student Ling Zhao, Zhao um, tried was to try to represent um, these pharmacophores as point clouds. So pretty much take methods that are used in image recognition, especially in 3D image recognition, and try to uh, apply them to, um, to our problem here. Now, we only look at, you can, those methods only worked with 3D, uh, three dimensions. They're meant to compare um, objects in three dimensions and try to, to match them in three dimensions. But what we're interested in matching are, um, objects in higher dimensions, because we're not only interested in the uh, spatial dimensions, but also the chemical properties. So what Ling Jia did uh, was to try to um, represent um, the problem as a, a higher dimensional um, space matching problem. Um, and in this case, it shows a couple of um, um, he used some uh, a distance matrix de uh, designed for pharmacophore comparisons. Pretty much looks like this, where you've got some different scores for different types of chemical groups. Um, and also, um, and then you have a scoring matrix for the distance between different chemical groups. And then I did some identif uh, identical dimensions in terms of partial charge and hydrophobicity in the, the binding sites and combine that with the, the spatial locations. So in fact, producing um, a five dimensional 
uh, space. And um, when they evaluated that um, on a number of data sets, some data sets that are used in, um, in just traditional binding and also in antibody antigen binding, and also more general protein-protein uh, interaction data, um, he found that he was able to, to recreate, to re-identify the, um, the binding from um, his method was able to cluster the, um, the things that bound the same molecule pretty much together. Um, so quite um, a positive result. Um, still needing some work, but promising. Uh, but this was really a, a proof of concept. This is a method, the advantage of it is that it is expand, uh, you can extend it by adding more dimensions. Uh, and uh, we haven't really done that yet. Um, the final thing I'd like to mention, I have, have no idea how I'm going with regard to time. Um, I will, I've just got a couple of other slides here. I just want to mention our current work, which is uh, my, my student uh, Chao Ye. Our problem with trying to learn antigen antibody binding is the lack of data. So what uh, Chao Jessica has started doing now is to try to build data set of antibody antigen binding um, so that we can use that for, uh, for machine learning pretty much. If we have hopefully a, um, a data set that's well labeled and is useful, then we can try to start learning, um, you know, binding, and hopefully be able to predict what an, what antigen and antibody is going to bind based on the um, antibody sequence. So what she did was um, build this data set by using docking between. Um, antibodies and, and antigens and, um, and pretty much build this, this table. Right now it's still fairly small, but she's used that as a proof of concept uh, to test a range of um, machine learning methods. And so far um, she's getting 76% um, uh, accuracy in predicting the antigen. Um, from the sequence of the antibody, which is promising. Again, we need to get more data and we need to refine this. Uh, and this is very much work in progress. Um, but what I've tried to give you in, um, in this very accelerated talk was to give you a feel from the sort of work that we've been doing, covering uh, antibodies from the gene to the protein um, and really using computational methods to try to, to refine um, our understanding and to allow us to make use of, the, of next generation sequencing of rearranged um, sequences because the clinical applications are, are huge. You, know, you can think of it, you know, if somebody is in the hospital, we can take his blood, we can sequence his antibodies and we can see what he's got immunity to. You know, that would provide already a huge um, uh, clinical advantage. Anyway, um, this, uh, these are the people who did the work and especially um, my students, Jian Chang, Li Zhao Zhao, and Chao Ye. Mike Bain is a collaborator and we also collaborated with um, immunologists and with um, uh, Stanford Pathology and Defiers Group. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing the screen. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable words.